This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance On Demand on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Right now, we're going to begin here. Manus Cranny, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen with our definitive call in the day on global fixed income. Wei Li is global chief investment strategist at BlackRock, prodigious in mathematics, and joins us here on our fears of price down and yield up. Wei Li, thank you so much for finding the time. Where is the bid on bonds? To me, the bid is walked away. Is that true? Is there just a dearth of bid across all of fixed income? There are lots of moving parts right now. Good morning, um, everyone. Um, in terms of our view on long bonds, long duration, we have been underweight U.S. long duration for three years now, since late 2020, when 10-year yields was below 1%. And last week, we closed the underweight to get to neutral. There are a couple of moving parts in terms of why rates have repriced so very meaningfully. The first piece is policy path repricing. And the second piece is term premium repricing and within that inflation premium is part of term premium. So where we are now with 10 year yields testing 5%, in our assessment, policy path is not that different from where we think it should be. But term premium, depending on which measure you use, we're looking at somewhere between 20 basis point, 40 basis point, uh, different methodology, actually could push even higher over the strategic horizon. So we're talking about term premium over the strategic horizon at 100 basis point, not out of this world because of fiscal imbalance, because of insurance dynamics, because of higher rate environment, uh, rate volatility, as well as because of higher inflationary uh, environment. So when you bring all of that together, strategically we're still underweight, but tactically we're now neutral because risks have now become more balanced. And when we think about kind of the read across of rate repricing to risk assets, actually policy path repricing can be negative for equities because it impacts the discount rates directly. But term premium repricing doesn't have to be negative for equities because it's more uh, an assessment of the relative appeal of duration in portfolios. Do you think, Wei, I know that you've been leaning into the whole AI discussion and the whole AI thesis, and that's been driving some of your equity bets. Do you think that that area is completely immune to term premia and these discussions of yields, given the cash cows that they've become? Well, what has been very interesting with regards to this mega tech and AI theme is that on the one hand, they benefit from the growth upgrades, earnings upgrades that we're seeing coming through. So, for example, next year, 10% EPS forecast for S&P 500. Half of that is driven by mega tech names, right? 5% is coming from the tech names. So they're definitely benefiting from earnings upgrades, which we uh, pay a lot of attention to. But at the same time, they are more long duration compared with the broader equity market. So when the rate reprices, it pressures down on long duration, a little bit more everything else being equal. But when you bring the two factors together, actually the, the, the growth prospect and the AI theme gathering momentum and the earnings upgrades actually trump the duration sensitivity as we have seen so far earlier in the year, but also in recent periods of rate repricing, actually the AI theme, the Nasdaq have been holding up better than you would have expected given the rate volatility. Well, good morning. I mean, just to carry on from that, this week they're going to see $16 trillion worth of equity reports and the magnificent part of the Magnificent Seven of tech are going to be in there. What Tom, Lisa and myself, uh, what we're talking about was the balance sheets, the cash on the balance sheets, the cash on Apple's balance sheet, the cash on the other big tech. Is that another defensive hallmark and a reason to endure and stay long big tech? That is why we are still uh, overweight, the big tech and the AI theme, because when we think about kind of quality characteristics as growth slows down, reacts to the uh, tightening environment that we're all experiencing, actually having cash on your balance sheet and not being as geared up in this environment is 
a definite uh, is a definite plus. And more broadly, we're talking about kind of uh, the impression of the earnings season. That the feeling is that it's holding up better, but actually not forget the broader backdrop, which is the earnings. Mm-hmm. Actually, the three quarters have been stagnating, and we're just talking about incremental rebound from the stagnating right. backdrop. So that's the big picture here. Waylee Lawrence from New York emails in and says, "Ask Waylee." If an institutional firm marks to market and everything else is on the balance sheet and the rationalization is I can own it forever and I'll get paid back eventually, baloney. How do you do the math on the midpoint of where the stuff you hold on the balance sheet gets a valuation? If I've got eight years of maturity, how close is it to where you get a tipping point where you've got to confront what's on the balance sheet? Well, first, say hello to uh, Lawrence. And second, <laughs> uh, yes, indeed, we have uh, we we have to see um, more repricing um, of risk assets reflecting the higher rate environment. We look at duration, well, kind of almost there, which is why tactically we turned neutral. But if you look at equities. Um, it has yet to reflect the higher rate environment uh, by our very simple kind of arithmetic, uh, kind of very simple back of the envelope uh, analysis. You know, like further five percent to ten percent adjustment is not you know un- mm-hmm. unthinkable. And then you think about private markets. There is also further repricing to, to go, which is why um, greater dispersion, greater selectivity is really warranted as we think about kind of deploying your risk budget in this environment because uh, uh, um, there is a, a different rate sensitivity across risk spectrum, which is why we're very selective uh, when it comes to right. equities. We're focusing on uh, sector yeah. style growing uh, earnings, but also very selective in terms of the private market. We like private uh, credit. We like infrastructure that uh, all these uh, parts of private markets that benefit right. from speculative wins. I don't hear full faith and credit there. Wei Li, thank you so much of BlackRock. Tom Satoris is with Strategus. It's a Baird company. He's had a fixed income, but he's got to b- bounce off the great Jason Trenner as well. And you floored me with an analysis that 70% of America are voters that are small business and they're in the churn, and they only make up 5% of the GDP. Has the Fed left them behind? in this yield environment? Well, I would very much say so. The Fed, by overly relying on the Fed funds rate to tighten, has put so much of that pain on Main Street USA. It's almost as if we've decided there's too big to fail. Earlier this year, we decided their medium is too big to fail, (coughs) medium-sized businesses, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, depositors there. So if that means that if there's Large companies are too big to fail. Medium-sized companies are too big to fail. The only place you can actually tighten in the U.S. economy these days is small businesses and households. And the Fed has done exactly that by overly relying on the Fed funds rate. With that said, balance sheet reduction is catching up with the bond market now, and we're seeing Treasury yields rise in the belly of the curve. Okay, and we'll get there in one sec, which is a technical underpinnings of why we're seeing a sell-off. But to stick on the point that Tom was talking about, if you have such a swath of the voter base that is feeling this kind of pain, and if you have small businesses that account for a significant proportion of the jobs losing momentum, when does that start to trickle into a higher unemployment rate? When does it start to reinforce and then actually bring rates down because of slower growth? Well, we were already at that point in March of this year. We were 48 hours from a recession, which would have been very deep. And then we had financial stabilization via liquidity injections. So when does it begin to bite again? Probably sometime between Christmas and we'll say Valentine's Day when the consumer gets those those uh, you know late uh, 2023 credit card bills in January and you start to see a pullback. I don't see any sort of slowdown in consumption. We didn't see it in the data last week. So that suggests to us the labor market is going to continue to remain strong at least until the end of the year. But at some point in time, those higher interest rates are going to bite all corners of the economy, not just small businesses and households. Are yields rising right now because of the perception of strength that is given by some of the bigger businesses that are much stronger? I don't think so. I think yields are rising because we're finally seeing supply come in and really scare those bond vigilantes. The bond vigilantes are back and they're pushing the term premium up on all treasuries, not just the front end of the curve now. Well, they've been unleashed not just in the U.S. Treasury market, but also in U.K. gilts and on boons. What goes through my mind is that when you trigger through 5% and you see the curve moving so aggressively, do you think that we hit some kind of a point of where risk parity trades begin to get smacked or where 
VAR limits at various, various trading houses get triggered? Do you think that we're going to go into that next evolution of where we see a real liquidation moment? That's a tough question because I think we've seen, now this is really the third substantial rise in 10-year Treasury yields we've seen over the last three years. Each time you've probably seen those VAR strategies take a turn of leverage off along the way. Mm -hmm. So the sensitivity today to a 5% is probably less than it was to a 3% two years ago because they've taken, from what we can see, there's been some leverage that's come off. With that said, there's always another break point. I don't know if it's 502 or 517, or we might have already hit it at 490. But there's a break point here where you're going to see another round of leverage come off. And that's part of the reason why we're, it's probably a multi-step process, but that's probably one of the reasons why we're seeing the S&P off again as well, and credit spreads inching higher, because I think we're getting close to that point again. So who steps in here? This is the debate that the three of us have had for the past two hours, which is duration heroes aren't to be seen yet. You're trading above 5%. Insurance companies have a different accounting system. They don't need to come in and, and hedge themselves. Who steps into this bond market? to cap yields. Well, there's, that's a, there's a good and a bad to this. The good is there's an enormous... Give me the good. The, the good is there's an enormous amount of plain vanilla core fixed income strategies that will just love to keep buying and buying and buying treasuries. The bad news is those are price sensitive investors. They're not like yeah. the leveraged investors sure. of the past. So they're going to basically come in after there's a concession. So treasury supply comes in, mm-hmm. yields tick a little higher, they come in and buy on the cheap. They're not going to be price insensitive who will buy on any yeah. dip. You are a grizzled veteran of this. I'm going to give you two ideas. One that we talked to Wei Lee about at BlackRock, which is the bid walks away. All of a sudden on price, folks, not yield, price of bonds, the bid walks away, and the great Chris Whalen calls this the Whalen silence. You're out there, you're on your phone. This is the old days, man. You had buy tickets here, sell tickets here. You're on your phone and you're going, I got a gazillion dollars of the Trenner, you know what? And there's just silence. Nobody wants that piece of paper. Are we close to that? Well, some would say we've actually hit that. People, there was a lot of fear about 30-year auction. There's a lot of fear about auctions on the front end of the curve over the last few weeks saying, there were even well, headlines. What about deaths? Norway calls up and they go, I got to sell a zillion years of that cranny of 2042. Is there somebody there to buy this garbage? There, there is, but you're going to have to put in a price concession. Uh, that is, yields are going to have to uh, push higher than what the market is trading at. And the Treasury is now no longer immune to this. I said price concession and the Bramo cam shook. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, like, what point? that's the reality. Just real quick here, Tom, mm-hmm. to sum it all together, are you getting compensated for the uncertainty right now? Are you buying duration? Uh, yes, we would be. I think you're being fairly compensated. Our own measure of the term premium on the 10-year Treasury, it's above 100 basis points. That's a very important level, not just symbolically, but what it's telling you is that you're getting right. a normalized uh, cushion for that uncertainty. This is where yeah. you normally would be. So we feel you're being compensated. doesn't mean we can't see yields tick right. higher here, mm. but you're being compensated for the risk going forward, I believe, at this point Jason in time. Jason from a cigar bar in the east side emails in and says, talk about me. Okay, let's talk about Jason Trenner. How does this fold in? <laughs> How does your fixed income analysis fold into Jason Trenner's call in this, on the equity markets? Well, it makes us that much more bearish on the economy because we continue to see another source of stress for the consumer and now right. businesses picking up here. So what we're doing is we've delayed recession and we've said we're going to avoid recession at all costs in 2023. But that itself, there's cost to that. And the cost is going to be that the breaking point is going to be when yields are higher, which means there's more risk of financial credit events. And are you predicting that? N- nothing that we can see right now, but by the nature of those types of events, there are places there you, you can't see them. So, so at a 5% 10-year treasury, yeah. it's much more likely than it was when we were at 350. Right. So where it is lurking, that leveraged investor who is, is right. caught off guard, we don't know. We don't see that happening at this moment, but it's on, on our horizon. Bottle it. Tom Sessoris there of Strategus there in fixed income, the effect across all of the American uh, uh, economy. Kathleen Bustjancic joins us now, uh, Chief Economist, Nationwide Mutual Insurance. Kathy, once again, you have failed, and everybody else, with a bang-up third-quarter GDP modeled out at 5%. You're going to tell me we can't sustain that. All my radar's up. Why can't we sustain above-average real GDP? Uh, Good morning, Tom. 
Well, th th it is unsustainable. Uh, and, and the main reason is that um, we, we just don't have enough workers, really. If, if you break down GDP growth, right, it, you, you look at the number of workers and how productive. Unless we're getting a real boom in productivity growth, really hard to sustain 5% growth. And what it also does in the meantime, as you know, is overheats the economy and makes it more difficult for the Federal Reserve to, to lower inflation. And that's their, their primary goal. So I, I think one way or the other, Fed will lower inflation and continue to lower it. Uh, but that, may, you know, that means that 5% is not very sustainable. Where are you on the... Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, where are you on the outlook for wages? Is the heat and, and I suppose the fury of wage negotiation, is that in the rear view mirror as you look into 2024? Yeah, good, good question, Amanis. So we're keeping an eye on, on wage growth, but what we have seen despite the numerous strikes um, that have popped up and, and concerns there, we've actually seen wage growth um, decelerate. Um, it's come down from six, seven percent. It's still running too high mm -hmm. uh, for the Fed's comfort, right? It's running around four percent or so, a little bit above that. Um, they'd really like to see that between three and three and a half to be consistent with two percent inflation. Um, but you know, going back to the la labor market is the key right now in terms of, of wage growth, but also it, how long this you know strong growth continues. It's not ultimately sustainable. But do we see some meaningful slowdown in the fourth quarter? That, that's really what's important. Tom chastened me a little bit earlier on. I, there's a great phrase that I use, if it's grand. It depends how I say the word grand. Grand can mean many different things. Mm -hmm. I said the U.S. consumer is grand. And Tom rightly chastened me. He said, did you look at the delinquencies on subprime in the, in the auto industry? Did you look at, at perhaps the underbelly uh, of, of what is going on? We're going to get retail sales. You know, it, it, they remain grand in inverted commas. But suddenly we're dealing with a shift in rates to above 5%. Would you describe the consumer as grand or how challenged does the consumer become in a world of where rates actually tightening, tightening, tightening? Yeah, I, I think that the, the way I would say it is the consumer looks to be grand, but there are a lot of headwinds um, hitting the consumer. Mm -hmm. Now, the tailwind has been the labor market. Very strong, right? As long as the labor market is churning out the amount of jobs, you know, 200,000, yeah. 300,000, right? The consumer is going to keep spending. But you have the still elevated inflation. You have uh, consumer loan payments, you know, kicking in. And as you said, certain demographics are really challenged right now, yeah. um, and, and delinquency is picking up a little bit. So it's not a completely rosy picture here, but I would just say you got to follow the labor market. That That is the key. So I, if I'm the Fed, I'm going to follow the labor market. I'm data dependent, but I, I would suggest November 1-ish is upon us, and you know we're, we're going to sort of have a post-Halloween party. I guess it's a non-meeting. December... For Kathy Busjancic, how key is the December meeting? Oh, it, it, it's important. Um, you know, I, I think each meeting is important in the sense, not what they do, but it's, it's what Chairman Powell guides us, right? What, what do we hear in the press conference? But December, we'll get the revised uh, forecast, right? We'll get the macro forecast and, and the dot plot estimate. Um, even though those aren't, you know, golden rule, right? It doesn't Thank mean God that's that. exactly what the Fed's going to do, right? But but yeah. it's guidance. Um and, um, you know, be, it'll be interesting to see. Our view is growth slows by more than half, right, in the fourth quarter. We see it running a bit above 2%. But I have to say that handoff, you know, Menace talked about retail sales. The handoff consumer spending to the fourth quarter was a bit firmer than we thought. Um, we really need to see consumer, we need to see growth for the Fed to feel comfortable below 2%. I mean, Chairman Powell told us he thinks yeah. potential growth is 2%, right? So yeah. he wants it on a sustained basis. I mean, Kathy, you're with Nationwide. Do you have tickets to Michigan <laughs> right around Thanksgiving? I mean, it's at Michigan. I get that. But you're Kathy Bus Johnson. Can you get us into 100,000 people at Ann Arbor? Only if you're, if you're voting for um, Ohio State. It can only do that. Very good. We're from Columbus and Nationwide. Kathleen Busjancic. Let's get right to it. Your definitive brief here on this transaction, $60 billion of a total enterprise value. Amrita Sen, expert at the micro foundations of the price of oil and also expert uh, out of the, uh, of, of the geography of oil. Amrita, I was up to speed on this in a fake way, and I'm getting up to speed quickly. Guyana, 2015, 
Exxon finds more oil than God in the Gulf of Mexico off of South America. This is Hess, and this is a Guiana acquisition by Mr. Worth in Chevron. Explain to our audience the magnitude of the Guiana oil fields. I think it's a fantastic uh, acquisition, if you ask me, given the fact that Guyana is actually going to be uh, the most prolific non-OPEC supply growth in the coming years. Exxon, like you said, already has footprint, and as does Hess. So Chevron now, through Hess, gets exposure to that. You know, Guyana's production has been growing by two to 300,000 barrels per day. Um, it's got several new FPSOs planned in the coming years. Uh, we're talking about production uh, reaching and well, breaching a million barrels per day and continuing to grow. So it is, like I said, the most promising non-OPEC supply uh, prospect. You know, we've had Brazil take that uh, position for the last few years, and that's now flipped to Guyana. So again, in, in, in that sense, a, a fantastic acquisition. What is the distinction of Guyana, and then I believe it is too, I've got to get my map out, Manus, I'm going down in flames here. What is the distinction between Guyana and Venezuela on the southern side of the Caribbean? I mean, of course, there's political stability for one, uh, and the quality of oil. The quality of oil Guyana produces is actually very good quality. It's sweeter. Um, it's really liked by even European refiners who sometimes struggle to process a lot of the heavier sour <coughs> barrels. Um, Venezuelan oil is very, very heavy oil. Um, it's liked by a lot of refiners who, like in the U.S. Gulf Coast, that have the capacity to process that. Uh, it requires what you call cokers, uh, but not every refiner has that. So Guyana's oil is is actually easier to process uh, in, in that sense. Of course, in today's day and age, though, because we have a lot of refineries around the world who need that heavy oil, the lifting of sanctions on Venezuela would actually be welcome, uh, of course, if that is to be sustained um, and if there are free and fair elections. And again, there are lots of question marks around that. I'm reading surveillance correction here, Guiana, to the east of Venezuela by 600 miles between Caracas yes. and Georgetown. Thank you. Nailing that. <laughs> One of our interns just saved me on that. I'm not going to fly with you, are Oh, no. and Rita, there is a question. Why are, we seeing, why are we seeing so many of these acquisitions right now in the oil patch? I mean, you know, this is something our uh, team, our uh, U.S. upstream team, has been pointing out since July. We actually identified 80 companies that we thought was up for grabs. Um, I'll happily share that list with you guys. And I think of that, about 17, 18 have already happened. It, this is, if you think about the shale patch of the last decade, uh, it was fueled by zero interest rates, and it was fueled by uh, focusing on not shareholder uh, growth or cash flow, but it was all about production growth. So it didn't matter whether you made money or not, just come pump and produce as much oil. That's changed now. Over the last few years, we've seen actually shareholders say, no, you actually need to return money to us, which means a lot of the acreage and a lot of the companies that had poor acreage just produced anyways, are uh, they have to get basically integrated with bigger companies who have economies of scale because that's the only way you can generate cash. So that's, at the, that's the main reason why we are seeing this. And then, of course, as interest rates go up, servicing a lot of these debts that they have, a lot of the companies have very, very high debts, just isn't feasible. And that's why you will continue to see consolidation. We think this is just the start and we're going to see a lot more going forward. So, Amrita, how much uh, is this also a result of maybe antitrust agents in the U.S. looking more favorably on some of these tie-ups because there is this goal to offset some of the supply fluctuations in the Middle East. I mean, look, I think that's at the margin, right? If you think about the kind of deals being done or look at the deals being done, it started uh, with Occidental uh, back, you know, not this year, but previously. It's always about getting the acreage, which is right next to yours, so that you can have economies of scale. And I think that's the underlying uh, reason for that. And of course, even with these acquisitions, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more production. More often than not, one plus one rigs is making, giving us 1.2 rigs, not two, because a lot of the rigs, like I was saying earlier, is actually poor quality. So the bigger company is simply saying, we're not going to produce from here, and therefore overall production actually goes down. Exxon and Pioneer are the exception there. Every other m and we've seen actually is leading to lowering overall guidance of the two companies rather than raising it. I'm really good to see you this morning. Does any of this deal-making that you see go through reflect 
anticipation of a change or a material change in U.S. energy policy. We're coming, I don't know whether we're coming to the end of a Biden administration, but we're going into an election year. Policy may change. America, oil independence is key. Any of the political aspects play into the potential for deal making? I don't think so in the sense, again, these are kind of company specific deals that we're talking about. I think the bigger challenge, of course, we have is, I mean, look, the U.S. is producing above 13 million barrels per mm -hmm. day, which is a record high um, anyways, and U.S. production continues to grow. Um, of course, the challenge I was saying is that you do have sanctions being lifted on Venezuela, even though elections haven't been held and there are still bans on the opposition candidate. That raises more questions okay. around the shale oil uh, guys and saying, why are we not being given the opportunity to produce even more rather than you going and doing deals elsewhere. Amrita, I'll see you in a month's time in Vienna. There is an official video of, of, of Amrita and I Absolutely. dancing uh, in, in OPEC during COVID, going toe to toe. See the life. Dancing. Yeah, we, that we, we are best. so sheltered. <laughs> sheltered. Living, the li living, living the life in Vienna. Quick question on Vienna as we go to Vienna. The theory is this, uh, that the US goes to refill the SPR uh, over the next couple of months, gives Saudi and Russia some kind of caveat to release some of the unilateral cuts. Is that pioneer? the sky, hopeful thinking. Uh, what is your anticipation as we go to do Vienna? Do not buy that. You don't buy that? Do not buy that. I, I, don't do, I do not buy that. I think Saudi Arabia has been very clear in saying they're keeping the cuts in place because of the macroeconomic uh, concerns. Look, the U.S. has said this before as well, that, oh, we're going to buy uh, it right. when it was kind of you know, less than $80, and they didn't. They've only managed to refill 4.8 right. well, million barrels, and they've come out and said, oh, we'll buy the oil when it's, you know, 79 or I don't think they're going to get there. I'm Rita Sen. Thank you so much. And on behalf of John Farrell and Lisa, Team Surveillance really looks forward to interviewing you in Vienna here at the next cranny. Sorry. Right now we're going to begin here. Manus Cranny, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keane with our definitive call of the day on global fixed income. Wei Lee is global chief investment strategist at BlackRock, prodigious in mathematics, and joins us here on our fears of price down and yield up. Whaley, thank you so much for finding the time. Where is the bid on bonds? To me, the bid is walked away. Is that true? Is there just a dearth of bid across all of fixed income? There are lots of moving parts right now. Good morning, um, everyone. Um, in terms of our view on long bonds, long duration, we have been underweight U.S. long duration for three years now, since late 2020, when 10-year yields was below 1%. And last week, we closed the underweight to get to neutral. There are a couple of moving parts in terms of why rates have repriced so very meaningfully. The first piece is policy path repricing. And the second piece is term premium repricing and within that inflation premium is part of term premium. So where we are now with 10 year yields testing 5%, in our assessment, policy path is not that different from where we think it should be. But term premium, depending on which measure you use, we're looking at somewhere between 20 basis point, 40 basis point, uh, different methodology, actually could push even higher over the strategic horizon. So we're talking about term premium over the strategic horizon at 100 basis point, not out of this world because of fiscal imbalance, because of insurance dynamics, because of higher rate environment, uh, rate volatility, as well as because of higher inflationary uh, environment. So when you bring all of that together, strategically we're still underweight, but tactically we're now neutral because risks have now become more balanced. And when we think about kind of the read across of rate repricing to risk assets, actually policy path repricing can be negative for equities because it impacts the discount rates directly. But term premium repricing doesn't have to be negative for equities because it's more uh, an assessment of the relative appeal of duration in portfolios. Do you think, Wei, I know that you've been leaning into the whole AI discussion and the whole AI thesis, and that's been driving some of your equity bets. Do you think that that area is completely immune to term premia and these discussions of yields, given the cash cows that they've become? 
Well, what has been very interesting with regards to this mega tech and AI theme is that on the one hand, they benefit from the growth upgrades, earnings upgrades that we're seeing coming through. So, for example, next year, 10% EPS forecast for S&P 500. Half of that is driven by mega tech names, right? 5% is coming from the tech names. So they're definitely benefiting from earnings upgrades, which we uh, pay a lot of attention to. But at the same time, they are more long duration compared with the broader equity market. So when uh, rate reprices, it pressures down on long duration a little bit more everything else being equal. But when you bring the two factors together, actually the, the, the growth prospect and the AI theme gathering momentum and the earnings upgrades actually trump the duration sensitivity as we have seen so far earlier in the year, but also in recent periods of re- repricing, actually the AI theme, the Nasdaq have been holding up better than you would have expected given the rate volatility. Well, Lee, good morning. I mean, just to carry on from that, this week they're going to see $16 trillion worth of equity reports and the magnificent part of the Magnificent Seven of tech are going to be in there. What Tom, Lisa and myself, uh, what we're talking about was the balance sheets, the cash on the balance sheets, the cash on Apple's balance sheet, the cash on the other big tech. Is that another defensive hallmark and a reason to endure and stay long big tech? That is why we are still uh, overweight, the big tech and AI theme, because when we think about kind of quality characteristics as growth slows down, reacts to the uh, tightening environment that we're all experiencing, actually having cash on your balance sheet and not being as geared up in this environment is a definite uh, is a definite plus and more broadly we're talking about kind of uh, the impression of the earnings season that the feeling is that it's holding up better but actually not forget the broader backdrop which is the earnings mm-hmm. actually the three quarters have been stagnating and we're just talking about incremental rebound from the stagnating right. backdrop so that's the big picture here Waylee Lawrence from New York emails in and says ask Waylee if an institutional firm marks to market and everything else is on the balance sheet and the rationalization is I can own it forever and I'll get paid back eventually, baloney. How do you do the math on the midpoint of where the stuff you hold on the balance sheet gets a valuation? If I've got eight years of maturity, how f- close is it to where you get a tipping point where you've got to confront what's on the balance sheet? Well, first, say hello to uh, Lawrence. And second, <laughs> uh, yes, indeed, we have uh, we we have to see um, more repricing um, of risk assets reflecting the higher rate environment. We look at duration, well, kind of almost there, which is why tactically we turned neutral. But if you look at equities. Um, it has yet to reflect the higher rate environment uh, by our very simple kind of arithmetic, uh, kind of very simple back of the envelope uh, analysis. You know, like uh, further five percent to ten percent adjustment is not you know un- mm-hmm. unthinkable. And then you think about private markets. There is also further repricing to, to go, which is why um, greater dispersion, greater selectivity is really warranted as we think about kind of deploying your risk budget in this environment because uh, uh, um, there is a, a different rate sensitivity across risk spectrum, which is why we're very selective uh, when it comes to right. equities. We're focusing on uh, sector yeah. style growing uh, earnings, but also very selective in terms of the private market. We like private uh, credit. We like infrastructure debt. Uh, all these uh, parts of private markets that benefit right. from speculative wins. I don't hear full faith in credit there. Wei Li, thank you so much of BlackRock. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.